Um, hi, I'm Eileen Weir. I'm the mayor of the city of Independence, and I just wanted to welcome everybody here today to the Independence Utility Center for this important meeting. We have a number of people joining us online as well. So thank you, uh, representatives, for being here. Um, and please make yourselves at home. The restrooms are out here in the hallway if you need anything. I'm here, and John Mayfield is here from the state. We're happy to be here to help you. I just want to say thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for everybody who's here today, and thank you for those who are joining us online. Uh, I'm Lewis Riggs. I'm chair of the Interim Committee on Broadband Development. Uh, we have several members of the General Assembly here with us today, and uh, each of those will introduce themselves in turn. I uh, want to introduce our, our host today. It will be Representative uh, Wes Rogers from the Kansas City area, Northland. And just want to make sure we got that in there. Um, we're, we're hosting a series of these across the state because what we found out is, as we study broadband, every region has different needs and everybody's basically at a different level as far as what their responses have been. And post COVID, we all understand there were glaring gaps in what we do and how we do it. So we're trying to figure out what the best case scenario is for us as both appropriators and policymakers. So we will generate a report as a result of what we do here. I encourage everyone to send what you have in terms of one-pagers, case studies, you name it, we'll read it, we'll incorporate it. But in order for us to make good, rational decisions, we need to be data-driven. In order for us to get at that, we need to see the numbers in the case studies, basically how to analyze what's going on, how we can best prepare ourselves. So at the end of the committee process, we will issue a report. We will also issue a series of recommendations. And our anticipation is we will turn the recommendations then into legislation. So we need to get all this good stuff done by the end of the calendar year. Uh, so if we seem like we're in a hurry, we are. But we want to make sure that we have everybody who wants to say something able to say something about what they're doing and and we're, we're going to answer basically three questions today the first is where are we the second is where do we need to be and the third is what steps do we need to take in order to get there so we'll have questions back and forth if you don't mind being interrupted from time to time trying to nail down exactly what it is we need to do at the statewide level as policymakers and appropriators to make broadband internet universal. Is 2021, what are we waiting for? So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Representative Rogers, and then we'll go ahead and do the introductions. You can hit the button on the bottom. These are fancier than what we have in Jeff City. Uh, Wes Rogers, uh, like Representative said, uh, north of the river, so my district is southwestern Clay County, uh, all of the city of North Kansas City, all of the city of Avondale, and most of which is Kansas City, in which I live. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm so thankful for Representative Riggs. He's been a real leader statewide in getting broadband access to everyone. Uh, something that is, and I, we can talk about this more later, but uh, coming at it from an urban perspective, I think it's always important to be talking about affordability as well as accessibility. And, and what I'm learning is a lot of times those go hand in hand. But with so many industry experts here in the room, I look forward to learning more than talking today. Um, should, would you like to introduce yourself? Or? Hello, everybody. My name is Emily Weber. I'm the state rep for District 24, which is the midtown downtown area of Kansas City. And this is a very important issue that, you know, during the pandemic, like Representative Grace was saying and Representative Rogers, you know, the, uh, we were seeing horrible issues uh, with broadband. Uh, my district, um, granted, we had Google Fiber, but the issue that we were seeing was a lot of people can't afford um, internet. So they didn't have access to it. So they were going to other places to to get internet during the pandemic. Uh, so I look forward to having this conversation and, and seeing what we can do to improve the, the needs that we need to do. Thank you. My name is Doug Ritchie, uh, state rep uh, from Eastern Clay County, the 38th district. So Excelsior Springs, Liberty, Kearney, Missouri City, Prathersville, that area. So uh, I was um, 
delighted uh, by the invitation from uh, Representative Riggs uh, because our two committees are going to have to be well coordinated. I'm chairing the Federal Stimulus Spending Committee. It's an appropriations committee on the House side. Uh, and we will uh, be working to make sure that the dollars required for uh, the expanded access for high speed internet throughout Missouri uh, will be uh, then uh, helped to be paid for, right? So I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone as well uh, so that we can determine the scope of the need as well as the most efficient ways uh, to, to cover the need, right? I think sometimes uh, in, in our world, when we talk broadband, uh, broadband has become a term sort of, sort of like Kleenex, right? Um, it, are we talking about actual broadband or are we talking about the term we use for high-speed internet access, uh, which could, could encompass any number of, of uh, methodologies? So uh, I, I definitely, I think that I would probably uh, be consistent with most everyone here. We need to make sure that we're, we're meeting the need in the most efficient and effective way possible. Uh, which means we're looking at a lot of different methodologies. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to that. This last week, uh, when uh, Representative Riggs's committee was meeting, uh, at the very same time, uh, our committee uh, was meeting looking at the complete overhaul of state IT. Because uh, when it comes to interacting with state bureaucracy, uh, anyone that has to engage with the state of Missouri, from individuals to businesses to even utilities, uh, we all find ourselves frustrated because it is so antiquated and uh, siloed off with multiple unique systems that don't communicate well with one another. So it's interesting. We're looking at a very, very uh, um, um, uh, exciting time where we're able to take a serious look at covering the state of Missouri with uh, high speed internet access as well as providing uh, a more seamless experience for people engaging with bureaucracy when it comes to state IT. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, thank you to the chairman for uh, the invitation, and I will now be quiet. So why don't we go around the room and introduce ourselves and what brought you here today? Uh, pick on you in the front. Can we start with you? Todd Burnage, KC Fiber in North Kansas City. How about we just go this way and then we'll come around and zigzag back. I'm Aaron Wendell. I'm also with KC Fiber and the Kansas City Internet Exchange. Jeremy Higley, the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. Tom Cruson with Comcast. Nicole Jacobson with Comcast. Andy Hachabat, guest of Cruson and Nicole. My name is Kristen Wood. I'm here with Goodwill of Western Missouri and Eastern Kansas. Jody Krantz, Independence EDC. Uh, Marlene Nagel, I'm in America Regional Council. Mike Lodewigan, uh, Charter Communications, Spectrum in the Marketplace. Chris Moody with OCTA, the Internet and Television Association. Kelly Weir, Mayor of Independence. <clears throat> Fred Drowning, the Missouri Association of Municipal Utilities. John Mayfield, State of Independence. Yeah. IT staff for the city, so. <laughs> And we've got several folks online as well. Um, and I, I know it can get tricky on Zoom, not talking over one another, but why don't, if you're here and uh, take a minute to introduce yourself. I, I see Mike Chambers there. How about you go first? All right, thank you. Uh, I am Mike Chambers. I'm the Regional Director of External Affairs for AT&T. I have Northwest Missouri, 32 counties in my territory. Uh, Clay and Platt County are in my area. I used to live in West Rogers District. I now live in Doug Ritchie's district, so I know you pretty well. Um, and delighted to be here today. I'll go ahead and jump in. Uh, I'm Representative Ashley Ani. Uh, I represent the 14th District uh, in the Northland as well. Um, it is uh, the southern part of Platte County, all the way up to Tiffany Springs. Uh, and I am thrilled to be here with you all today and listen to what everyone has to say. I'm Leslie Scott of the KC Digital Drive, and I'm also consulting with the UM uh, Broadband. 
I'm Ann Ames. I'm the new Government Affairs Vice President for Windstream for Nebraska and Missouri. Hi, I'm Tony Lupino. I'm with UMKC and I'm on the steering committee for the UM System Statewide Broadband Initiative. Hello, I'm Alan Monromius with AT&T. Hi, I'm uh, David Gervin. I'm um, Connect Sun Connect, formerly uh, United Electric Cooperative. And uh, yes, enjoying everyone talking about broadband. I'm, I'm glad the state's actually uh, you know, going to take listen to everybody and, and hopefully appropriate the right way, which I know you're always trying to do. Thank you. Did everybody get a chance to say hi that wants to say hi? Sorry about that. I'm BJ Tanksley with Missouri Farm Bureau, joining remo remotely from Jefferson City. Hello, uh, this is Joel Lawson with the Missouri Public Utility Alliance, uh, joining remotely from Columbia, Missouri. Okay. Thank you all for being here. And can everybody on the screen hear all right? Yes. So now that we've introduced ourselves, I let's go ahead and get started. Uh, First thing I'll say is that it's amazing that this many people from this many walks of life and this many stakeholders are in one room to do this. Um, and so hopefully if you got something to say, say it now, because you, you got a big audience and, and people are going to be listening to you. Um, and as Representative Rick said, you know, we're going to put together this report. It's going to go in front of the legislature. And if it's like the other things that Representative Riggs has been in charge of, we're going to get a very clear, concise set of objectives and goals when this when this gets written up and goes to the rest of the legislature. Uh, so if you've got if, if your piece of this is something that you feel it should be in this report, and now is the time to do that. And so speak up um, if you any questions questions, ask questions, but uh, just know that we are listening and that what you say now could very end up as a recommendation to the whole legislature next year. Um, so that said, we had uh, several questions presented before today, and I'm curious, is there anybody here that just, you know, I think what's going to happen is we're going to end up coming to this from a lot of different directions. So is there anybody that just jumps up and says, this is, this is where we should start this very broad conversation? So then I'll chain a little, little bit. And again, because we're in the city, you know, we, we've got relatively decent accessibility compared to the rest of the state, compared to affordability. Um, I'd be curious, maybe start with affordability is where that conversation goes. So is there anyone here that, yeah. I'll just start that. I, there really are two issues. There's affordability and, and adoption. And, uh, adoption and availability. And, you know, in this market uh, between Comcast, Charter and AT&T, we probably serve 99% of the homes here. And the real issue in the suburbs and the urban markets is getting people to take the service and making that affordable for them. And this is an issue that Comcast uh, took note of 10 years ago. And we started a program called Internet Essentials, where uh, families that qualify for the federal reduced school lunch program can get service for $9.95 a month. And we've since expanded that that program. I've got some materials here that I want to leave with with everybody. But I think if if the state can look at ways to, and this has happened in other other states too, where they've taken some of the federal money for broadband that comes down and maybe give it directly to school districts, and then the school districts can create bulk accounts for families in need of of this service. And, you know, they send us one bill and it covers all those those students. Um, I think that would be something the state should look at maybe starting a program like that, that uh, that funds students in need. Did yeah, you know, if this, is, this, this is Leslie with KC Digital Drive. Um, so, so there's a, a wide variety of federal funding, including the Emergency Connectivity Fund that's going to do just what um, it was mentioned earlier. Um, we have a, a program, the Internet Access Support Program, that provides up to $225 in um, funding for past due balances and $75 a month for uh, six months uh, for monthly service. 
and um, you know, we work with a lot of people, about a thousand folks that we've been helping since um, uh, early December. And, um, you know, so there are, um, there's, there's a lot of um, confusion on behalf of, of clients sometimes as to uh, what they can get. And um, there, there seems to be, I'm assuming, uh, some pressure on the customer service reps to um, upsell uh, customers. I don't know if there's quotas or, or whatever, but you know we're hearing from customers who, for instance, don't know that they have voice service as part of their, uh, their package, or they don't know that they have a bundle that is not unlimited. And then as their kids have been in remote school, um, you know, and, and gone over those, um, those caps, they get hit with a big bill, um, you know, in, in the next month. So, um, I didn't speak up when you said, where should we start? But, um, there's a lot of federal funding that's coming out. Um, we have one lonely person in our state broadband office. I feel like there's a, a ton of opportunities here to, um, you know, connect things together, knit knit the uh, ecosystem together um, with all the different aspects of uh, that are broadband, you know, internet access related. Any one of the three legs of the stool, um, and you know, to do that, um, and I don't know, I'm preaching to the choir here, Representative Riggs. Um, but I, I do believe that we really do need to expand our broadband office and, and look at how we can strategically um, roll out that funding, um, both as it's um, coming down to the uh, municipalities directly and as it goes to the state to, to be doled out, um, depending on the type of funding. So um, I, I guess I just propose um, you know, looking at this from a more systems perspective, um, internet does touch so many things, as we well know. I don't have to bore everybody listing them. So, you know, how do we how do we look at it through that lens? And then, from the affordability perspective, um, how do we get more people to to know about um, the programs that can help them? For instance. Um, there was no funding for um, outreach for the emergency broadband uh, benefit program. So how could the state step in to provide some funding for on the ground organizations to get the word out about that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Tom, just a real quick follow up on your comments. Um, the program that you guys have have operational for those families who would qualify for free or reduced lunches is that correct? Is that okay? Um, what's the funding mechanism for that? Is that through um, similar to you know like on cell phone bills where we're all kind of paying an additional uh, tax, if you will, to help supplement the needs of no. others, or is there a different funding mechanism? No, it's 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 just the price we offer those those families. Okay, so it's 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 driven by Comcast in yes. terms of their willingness to kind of give back. Yeah, okay. right. we want to have those those families connected. In fact, recently we've noticed that uh, one issue is these people may have been customers previously, and maybe they had debt issues and. Uh, you know, they weren't able to pay their bill and they've been disconnected. Well, recently we've, we've decided that we really want these people to have internet service. So we're going to waive that debt just to get them back so their, their kids can get uh, get internet service. Okay, thank you. And I was just informed that on the, oh, I'm, we'll, we'll give me one second. On the, on the TV, there's a raise your hand function. So if there's something you wanna say, you can hit the raise your hand button and we'll make sure that, uh, that you get a chance to speak. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Um, I'm Andy Hakaba, and uh, here uh, at the request of our Comcast friends, uh, I've got a background with uh, 
chairing the Intergovernmental Advisory for the FCC, uh, being on the Broadband Deployment Advisory for the FCC, and chairing the Information Technology and Communications for the National League of Cities. This is a topic that's very close to my heart, and it's something uh, trying to get broadband out to everyone has been a topic that I've worked on since probably about 2005, so very early adopter on this. Um, you asked the question, where should we start? And there are lots of entry points into this. Um, there's lots of money in the system right now that's being allocated to solve the problem. The biggest problem that I see, however, uh, is who do we solve it for? Do we really know the people, the households? The, do we have the granularity of the data? And you said you wanted this to be data-driven. Yes, it should be. But do we have the granularity of information to know who does and who doesn't have access? whether it be for affordability or accessibility. And that has been a huge problem. Um, they've tried to do it uh, in many different ways at a national level. There's absolutely no way they can do it at a national level. They can't figure it out. Because we can go through neighborhoods right now and we can see one side served and the other side not. Or we can go to our schools and see which kids have access and which kids do not. Um, you know, a, a strong recommendation I would have is let's push down as far as we can the um, identification of who does and who doesn't have it into our communities, into our schools, into our, our, our cities, uh, into our neighborhoods so that we can really truly understand who does and who doesn't have the data uh, or, or internet access. and. It becomes very clear when you do that. Communities need to step up and own this <laughs> and say, we know who does and who doesn't have it. But it's a hard problem for them. So when you start moving up to a state level or to a national level, it becomes even more difficult. Um, one of the um, options and solutions that have the, the providers around the table and uh, the fiber providers have been doing is uh, you know, trying to get their lines as close as they can to everybody. And in the cable business, they've done a pretty good job of that over the years because of their agreements with the cities to have the uh, the, the franchise work that they did in the cities. Um, but that doesn't mean that everybody has it. And so we've got to figure out that part of the equation to be successful. And uh, I think you know, now we're at a point where we've never been before, where there's a national recognition that broadband is infrastructure, that broadband uh, uh, matters to everybody. This pandemic that we've been working on has highlighted that for a lot of people, um, education, healthcare, the whole bit. Uh, it's, it's become a critical, critical service to everybody. And so um, how do we figure out who doesn't have it? And uh, there are some models out there um, that you ought to be looking at from the state of Missouri. One of them is Minnesota. They've done a pretty good job. Um, they've had a, a broadband office that has been very aggressive in trying to make sure people are connected and that their uh, connections are strong and uh, that they're affordable and they know how to do it and so forth. Um, I, I, Kentucky, I believe, is another one that's been out there as one of the leaders. And so there are models out there. I don't think you have to start from square zero. But even when you follow some of their models, you still have to answer the question, who has it, who doesn't? And uh, the, the minute you can begin to get your arms wrapped around that one, I think the money's there to, to take care of it. Just anecdotally, um, and Representative Riggs has talked about this too, but anecdotally, my mom lives in rural Platte County where, where I grew up. And if you look at the federal data that we're given and the maps that they create, she's bright green. She's got great internet. And I know for a fact that she doesn't, and nor do any of her neighbors. So when you know, we're talking about, let's start with actual data, what problem do we have? You know, who are we trying to help? And then we're looking at this information that I know is not right. That's, that's a frustrating starting point. So I, I appreciate what you, what you said there. Well, my mom lives south of Columbia, and she had a similar problem up until about three months ago when another provider was able to, to build fiber up to the area, but the cell signals were very weak there. Um, 
there were there was DSL in the ground, but they weren't upgrading any of that. That was a century link thing, I believe. And uh, the only other option they had was satellite, and it was terrible. And so um, she basically didn't have the kind of connectivity to have a video call or, or have a conversation with her doctor or talk to her grandkids or whatever the case may be. And now she does. Okay. Which is a great story, but the reason why is because there became a lot of new development around her and then it became interesting to the people who wanted to make money to do that. Right. There are a lot of people sitting in, you know, 1900s farmhouses somewhere that have no connectivity. And there are a lot of people, and we can't forget the people in the cities that don't have it either. And so it's, this is a big problem, and there's a reason why I've been working hard for a lot of years to try to solve it. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen by December. Uh, but perhaps you'll have a, a, a pathway to go at that point in time that will um, make this progress better or this problem better. To your point, we, we consciously patterned our Missouri program after Minnesota's. Nice. They have an office, not an officer, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of what they do is accountability. They're out basically on site, making sure that people are deploying on time, on task. To this point, we have one FTE. Uh, to my knowledge, he doesn't have full-time staff. Yeah. So we, we have spread our broadband director about as thin as he can go. And if we're talking some realistic you know, big number funding, $250 million is, is the current ask for the state fund, which is far more user friendly than anything that the feds have. Uh, we're going to need a fully staffed office. So three or four FTEs as I sit here looking in Doug Ritchie's direction. Um, but that's something we have, as we've gone around, that's, that's a consensus we're hearing a lot of is we, we need more availability of folks um, to, to do exactly what we're talking about, which is more right. coordination. Uh, and that's something I know in your card says, Tom, that you also uh, are in Wisconsin. Yes. Last I knew they were at 500 million for their broadband yes. asset. Is, yes. is that number still true? They're putting a lot of money into the uh, broadband program in Wisconsin too. And they actually have started a program with the school districts and we're working with some of the school districts that we, we serve in Wisconsin to identify who doesn't have service? Because after this pandemic, the school districts know the families yeah. don't have service. And, and that's he is telling us now it's 23% of all the students in Missouri right now uh, don't have 25 3 access. And we know they're out there. Of, right. We get the phone calls from mom and dad on the parking lot. I, I can't get into the school. Um, I'm trying to upload the assignment. Uh, we've got the director of agriculture who has to go to Macon, Missouri, to upload vet records at McDonald's off the Wi-Fi hotspot. Mm -hmm. I mean, these stories are everywhere. Um, but we know now with COVID, people are really measuring this stuff in deadly earnest, and, and the gaps are just glaring. So thank you for yeah. Your well, I'm encouraged that you have the broadband office. Uh, I will say, I, th I think it's Angie who's leading the Minnesota one now. It was Dana McKenzie who started that. Um, they've done a good job, not just with accountability, but they've also done been very creative in the way they've put things together to be able to create uh, um, an environment that makes sense to deploy in. And uh, they've been able to pull the partners to the table and, and truly make it a partnership. And that's a, a good way to be. Yeah. Their, their statute actually allows for folks basically to stand up LLC. So some of the really problem yeah. areas geographically, and we have them in Missouri Southwest, uh, LIC is for, for one purpose only, which is to deploy basically as a pass through to get the, the, the fiber out, uh, the resources where they need within yeah. the state geographically. Very good. We got Tom uh, and then I Jeremy. I say this, Missouri did pass a great broadband bill three, four years ago, 18. and it just, you know, frankly, the funds haven't been there to really uh, see that to fruition. So I think there's a, a good plan in place, but, you know, I think funding is, has been an issue for, for that program. So first I want to say thank you for taking the time to actually come out into the communities all across the state. I know you're hosting multiple ones of these um, in, in have that perspective and that context, as you said, about trying to address this issue. Um, I want to hit on two things that, that I think provide some context and 
how we should think about this. You know, whenever we, we talk about speeds, whether it's 25.3 or whether it's symmetrical gigabit speed, whatever it is, we need to remember that that's the advertised maximum speed. So really what we're saying is equal or less than 25.3. Um, you can do uh, your own speed tests online and see what you actually get. And especially with more and more of us doing video calls, uh, we're not getting our advertised speed. And that's that's just the way it is. Um, and we just need to be aware of that. So just for some context there. Secondly, uh, we partner, the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City partners with the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA, to host the state broadband directors across the country. Um, we hosted them here in Kansas City pre-pandemic. Uh, we had, I think, about 35 states, Puerto Rico, uh, and Hawaii even were there. Um, and it provides a great time to for them to learn from each other. Uh, selfishly, it's great for me because it helps me um, stay up to speed on what's going on in this space. Uh, so we're happy to do that. One of the things that we can see um, and that we have seen uh, with the pandemic is, is CARES Act money started going to the states and states were told, hey, we have this funding go out and get hotspots out in the schools, help people sign up. Um, that requires real people. And so I was talking to some of our state broadband directors, I won't name names, um, but they shared with me, you know, this is, on one hand, this is great because I've always wanted to be able to do something like this in our state. On the other hand, I don't have the time or the capacity or the relationships or knowledge to do it. And so I don't think uh, we can, gloss over the fact that with more money coming to the state, it requires more resources to support it. Um, I would not think of this when, when I'm working and talking to local communities, I don't hear them saying we are scared of having more support from the state. They're looking for to the state to provide information on the mapping, um, to do some of the GIS work, uh, and to manage some of the relationships through that grant making process. So uh, just a few thoughts on that. Hand up. Okay. And I can't see the names from here. Mike Chambers. Oh, Mike Chambers. Mike Chambers. Chambers. Mike. 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 Thank you, Representative Rogers. Uh, I just quickly wanted to kind of chime in with the, the cable folks that are there. AT&T has its own affordability program as well. It's called Access AT&T. It's $10 a month. There's no credit check. There's no fees for payment. It's Ten dollars a month. It's free installation. It's a free modem. So uh, and and it has just the same. If you qualify for the school lunch program, if anyone in the household qualifies for the school lunch program, they qualify there. So that I, I think there are a number of affordable programs out there like that. I know, uh, and it's and I and I don't. I know you guys have had this many times, and you probably. I don't want to be redundant, but I know that. Uh, the adoption and education is an issue. I know Madeline Romeus and I both participate in the uh, the digital inclusion committee that the Kansas City has. They meet monthly. Uh, there's a lot of good agencies out there that are that are working hard to get the word out to people about the programs, uh, the people that need the information. But it is it is difficult. So that would probably be. A good use any type of educational program. I've met a lot of um, senior citizen type folks that uh, just are scared to death of the computer or anything technical. So any type of educational program that it, that can assist them, it just it's very time consuming. Takes a lot of one on one. Uh, and again, there's probably a lot of good agencies out there that could help in that regard, but I, I just wanted to mention AT&T's access program, and it's it's available anywhere where we have the high-speed internet of at least 25.3. And who else has their hand raised up? Oh, to, Tony, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I wanted to echo and expand a little bit on the theme of uh, we don't really have all the door-to-door -door information we need. Uh, you know, one of my mentors used to talk about when you have a complex problem, make sure you understand the as is circumstances first. So that's a few things. Uh, part of it is who is really connected. And to find that out, 
Uh, what we're thinking in our University of Missouri system initiative is we need more trusted community organizations to help us get that information. We're talking about making students available to help with that if it fits. Uh, but it, part of it's the connectivity, but the adoption part is as or more complicated, which is if people are close to it, why aren't they using it? And I think since, since this is being hosted in independence, I, I'll say that I think we need a bit more plain speaking about some of these issues, meaning when people started telling me when I first got involved with this a couple of years ago about upload and download speeds, those numbers alone meant very little to me. I needed to ask, well, tell me what I can or can't do without those speeds. Start to make it real in terms of how does this help my child do their homework or how does it help somebody apply for a job or et cetera? How do we get to healthcare? care? Um, and so I think we need a much more conservative. But Mike said it right. We need more education. And that may take a um, dispersing a lot of active people in the community. We um, Part of our UM system initiative is really centered in extension where the extension folks in every county really know who the trusted community organizations are that we can maybe work through. So that's part of it. Another thing to, uh, to as a kind of a first step we, when we got into this a few years ago is try to figure out who's already doing what that's working different parts of this problem. So I'm going to put in the chat a link to a thing that the university built called the Missouri Broadband Resource Rail that, among other things, leverages technology, which folks in Kansas City will probably be pretty uh, accustomed to. If you've heard of SourceLink that connected the entrepreneurship uh, facilitators around uh, the metro to figure out who's actually doing what and, and give me a way to get to the exact type of resource I need. There's a resource navigator on this uh, on this website where you can answer questions like, are you looking for digital training organizations? Are you looking for people working on infrastructure, getting devices out affordably, et cetera? And so we're trying to grow the, the database there. There's a, a system there if you click on it to just say, hey, I'm involved in part of this. I'll fill out a, a form with a few questions that says, here's what I do and how I can help. And it's meant to connect people. Uh, there's also a lot of, uh, we, we partnered in doing that with All Things Missouri Cares, which is a data mapping function and a really sophisticated one out of Columbia, uh, out of extension, to, to start to take this, if we get this more granular data, to then visualize it and put it out there where everybody can see it. There's also a lot of educational materials and um, a project that we're doing now. In fact, several of my colleagues aren't here today because they're uh, in a training with extension about going into communities and tailoring plans to their particular circumstances and needs. And then another thing we're working on, and Leslie Scott, who's, who's uh, made a few comments today and is collaborating with us, has pointed this out. We've seen a lot of programs with funding where it's not really clear if there are nice performance metrics to measure success out there. If we start doing these things, how are we really doing the job with this money? And so the university is working on being helpful with every partner we can find to start uh, figuring out how do we evaluate the success of this programs to make sure we're spending the money wisely. So I would encourage you to take a look at the uh, Missouri Broadband Resource Rail. It's got a lot of assets that a very large team put together uh, locally here in Kansas City. The Coalition for Digital Inclusion has helped us uh, and added to it and works with it, uh, the public library and others, KC Digital Drive and others involved in the city. Um, so, but I, I totally endorse the notion of we need better starting place information to do a better job. And I just wanted to say thank you for, for your efforts also that we're going to have uh, University of Missouri, Marshall Stewart in front of the full committee basically explain a lot of what you've done. But I want to drill down just a little further where we've got you on the line. As far as case studies, you mentioned the trusted partners extension in every county in the state. Uh, you guys have done some work, Clinton County in this area, Bollinger uh, down in the southeast corner, case studies. Um, you guys are, are looking at metrics and, and basically how deployment goes in different areas of the state. What have you been able to glean from that to this point that you can share with us today? Okay. Uh, well, the, the, first of all, the educational component we talked about is key to get people to want to support efforts to get broadband in their communities. Uh, in Bollinger, they've got a very active broadband committee. They're ready to go. And so it's really there. It's more of a question of figuring out the available resources and coming up with perhaps a private public partnership that works well. One of the things we've done at UMKC is we studied several public private partnerships from across the country 
and taken some notes on that, which we can package up and share to see what worked well. Some of them, uh, and there were different approaches. Some worked through utilities, uh, some did other things, some are municipally owned. Uh, it's, it's a long story. So it's, we don't, uh, uh, Representative Briggs, we don't have a recipe that says do it this way. We have more of anecdotes, but we think, you know, pretty good ones uh, that we can take pieces of and maybe put together in a, in a particular community. Uh, the, the Digitally Connected Community Guide Project that we're working on with extension that you can see described on the, uh, on the broadband resource rail uh, is meant to draw on all that we've been able to compile and then apply it to a community with the community, have them really apply it with, with just some facilitation. And, and that includes, and this is not me, but others on our team, finding the right package of technologies depending on terrain and all kinds of stuff that's beyond my uh, capabilities. Um, so I don't know if that's right. It's not, I, I wish I could give you a, a more um, clear answer, do it this way, but we're not quite there yet. But we've gathered a lot more information than, than you might suspect. So. Is that helpful? Is that, is that what you're Yes. Um, it, Tony, just to, this is Doug Ritchie. I just to follow up on uh, UMKC's effort uh, related to an earlier comment I made. When you guys are doing these studies and you're talking about broadband, can you define broadband for me when you're talking to these various <laughs> communities? Are, are you guys in, intending to be technically focused on broadband as the methodology, or are you looking at that as more of a catch-all term? Uh, yeah, we, what we actually have been trying to do, frankly, is avoid the term because it is too mysterious. We've been trying to translate it into, let's start with, what you can do with high-speed internet in education, economic development, healthcare, uh, and, and just sort of quality of life. And then from there, start giving examples of, with these speeds, you can do this, and without these speeds, you can't. And so we try to, to actually not just broadband, when we say that, people often say, what do you mean? So I, I think you're on to a, a good issue. It has to be translated. Broad, I mean, broadband or high-speed internet is a tool, it's not an end. Well, right, and, and I think that for, for, for us, for our purposes, especially as we're having conversations, I mean, we're all using the term broadband. So I think it's important for me personally to know are, when we are using that, are we talking specifically, you know, cable on the ground, or are we talking about other means to arrive at ultimately what I, I think we're talking about, and that is um, effective high-speed access. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And one of the things we found, and there is some, it can be some tension in this where there are limited resources, is short-term solutions like Wi-Fi hotspots and longer-term solutions like fiber. And, and you know, in a given community, if your kids are having trouble doing their homework and they're having to drive to the library parking lot, you might want a short-term solution right now. But to get the full job done, we're going to need multi-year plans that also have to start right now. So that's, I think, as we think these through and we're going into any community, you have to sort of balance that and make sure people are aware that we're trying to work both parts of that problem. And then one, one additional question, this is more for anyone that wants to, to, uh, to respond, uh, next technologies. So we know that currently, you know, fiber is the thing. Um, you have other methodologies that are currently accessible. But as we're looking at the next five, 10 years down the road, making sure that Missouri is under this tremendous, effective, efficient, um, and affordable net of high-speed internet access, uh, what does the next technology look like that's on the horizon and, and how do we anticipate that? Hey, Representative, I, I, I think what sort of the, the trend of the day is is fiber to the home and you know, fiber to the, to the premises, if you will. And, you know, that, and that's fine. I, I think that's something we all have to be cognizant of. And, and if it is doable, I think that's something we should consider. But I think if there's a rub there and you're seeing it kind of with the conversation with the infrastructure bill in Washington is, how far do you go if there's if there are access issues? Because fiber is expensive. The fiber to the premises is expensive. How far do you go to push that to where it then becomes a disincentive to go into those other areas? Because now 
someone may have may end up having to go back to areas that may have access to 100 over 20 or have access to 50 over 10, which is still capable of doing a lot more than what I think what you would typically get with trying to figure out the right way to say this, but with the concerns of the providers that may be meeting the 25-3 threshold, but may the service may be a challenge when the residents try to address it. So what is that rub, right, from a policymaker standpoint? What is the rub of what are we going to incentivize? Are we going to go too far to where it becomes a problem to where everyone focuses back on their existing network instead of going out? You know, Charter, you know, our RDOF, our RDOF projects are all fiber to the home. Um, and we will do that in, all, in, a lot of pro, in a lot of projects, but we feel very confident in our, our hybrid model between fiber and coax that we can deliver gigabit speeds and they're consistent and reliable um, in order to do exactly what is needed to be done um, in, today's, in today's world. And given even all of the rush to the, to the network that happened with COVID. So, you know, I think fiber would be great, but even as you consider even more, even faster speeds beyond whatever fiber, you know, what the next iteration of fiber the home is, you know, how far do you go before you disincentivize, you know, that expansion out to the areas that don't currently have it? You know, just to follow up on that, is fiber going to be obsolete anytime soon? I, I don't know. I, there's, I mean, there's arguments to be made that with our, with some of our existing network, I mean, we're seeing things from our our technology that you can actually get up to 10 gig by just switching out, you know, a piece within the home over our fiber coax model, the fiber coax hybrid model. And so, you know, there are there are a lot of technological advancements that I don't even know how to speculate on because I'm just a government affairs guy. Right? I, don't, I don't understand some of that stuff, but um, you know. Obviously, there's going to be a next iteration of it. I just don't know what it is. No, I'll just say it. I've actually talked with folks who are telling me that light is the next big thing. We're going to, we're going to use light to do it. Okay, where's that technology? Well, it's, it's not even beta yet. It's, it's on the drawing board. Uh, do we know? No. Uh, at this moment in time, what's the most viable option? I think we're looking at it. Um, as far as the, the take rates, we talk about adoption. Um, I know of a, a, a co-op that is 400 households away from blanketing the entire service area, and they treat it like a political campaign. So we talk about boots on the ground that actually go out, they knock doors like a political campaign. We're coming to your area, here's what we're doing, here's what this means to you. They actually explain what high-speed internet means. It's not email, it's not checking the kids on Facebook, it's telemedicine, it's online education, it's working from home. Uh, we've had people from St. Louis County come out to it's this district to, to my south, uh, to Mark Twain Lake, because they go there on the weekends, they drown worms. Not, not drowning worms on the weekend anymore, they're drowning worms all week long. Uh, taking the, the weekend homes, they're putting investments into them, they're becoming their permanent homes. So we're, we're seeing an acceleration, you know, of recreational usage, areas like that where the take rates are approaching 90% or better. And the folks who don't have it are typically older than folks in this room. Um, and the regret is when it's time to sell that house, it won't be able to be sold without that. Also, the thing I hear from county commissioners is once we have fiber to the home, the assessed valuation per parcel increases five to 7% automatically. So how do we raise revenue without raising taxes? We add value to the property. And that's something that the, the fiber at this moment is delivering. So the folks I talked to basically, the future proofing, exactly what you said, the new technologies are increasing the speeds already. Um, talked to one co-op, they switched out twice in the last 12 years to modernize their equipment. 10-1 used to be revolutionary, now it's a dinosaur. Uh, so, you know, as folks, find these new technologies, they deploy them, and we're in a pretty good place. Um, but the whole thing with the, the satellites beaming down from low space orbit, talks to folks like, yeah, it's great when there's no rain, there's no cloud cover, and oh, by the way, I didn't park the car in the garage. 
So I know it's out there. I know it's been talked about. I know the feds are funding some of that. The question is whether or not it's something we need to be doing, you know, to prioritize that as a state. So what's obsolete? How long is it going to take? Do we know? Not as of this moment, we don't. So just I'll be quiet now. But it's just something we, we have taken a look at that. And, you know, folks within the committee, we're, we're all options are on the table. We just want to hear everything that's out there. So thank you. I just can't see well enough. It looks like there may be hand raised on the screen. Yeah, Mike Chambers and David. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Let's do Mike and then David. I'm sorry. I think that hand raise of mine might have been from before. I don't show that my hand is raised on mine right now. I, I apologize. Hey, how about David? Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, just echoing what you were talking about technology. Um, I think the big thing we've seen in some of the auctions that have gone past is, um, you know, there's technologies that are going to be technically be able to do certain speeds, but what can do it right now? And I think fiber is probably um, what we believe. You know, you can do 10 gig, they're doing 2 gig to the home now. It's a common thing that's been deployed by Google and other large MSOs. Um, so I believe fiber is probably. Um, you know, the strongest candidate right now. Um, but I'll, I'll go back to just some background. I'm not going to bore you too much, but I worked for a co-op for a decade, uh, electric co-op in northwest Missouri. Um, and we had the same thing. It was uh, The data was terrible. 477 data was saying that things were served, but we surveyed our actual members and uh, it was highly inaccurate. You know, one person in that block obviously knows if they've got service, that whole census block is not available for any funding mechanism. So. Anyway, we surveyed and we had 40% of our membership who had uh, didn't have 10-1. This is like nine years ago. So there was a definite need and talking about aggregating and getting data, um, that was the only way we could find data was actually doing a physical survey with members and talking to them at our annual meeting and that's how we came up with that data. And that's not always going to be effective on a large scale, obviously, and this is just the micro in the co-op space. Um, but we built out over, you know, two and a half thousand miles of fibre in the last seven years. Uh, we 100% serve our membership and we also serve 12,000 other people who were in uh, a span distance of our line. So uh, we were the, uh, the most rural co-op in the state of Missouri. We had 2.4 members a mile uh, and actually that's 2.4 metres a mile, about 1.7 members a mile. And everybody said it couldn't be done. Um, we had, uh, we got an ARA stimulus grant with when uh, Obama was in, um, that helped it. That did, obviously didn't pay for it. Um, and we had an approach that we don't want, we don't want to get money that we have to keep on getting money. This thing has to be sustainable. So I think that's a big crucial part is we've got to get away from that, you know, lack of a better term, the welfare model. If we, whoever's going to take it needs to build it and maintain the thing or stay out of it. Um, and I think, uh, I'm somewhat biased, but in a, in a co-op space, Como, us, there's been half a dozen co-ops in the state of Missouri who've been able to successfully uh, build out our lines and, and do fibre, 100% fibre, uh, and deploy to our membership at 100%. Um, and, you know, I think we have a model in place where it's going to, you know, sustain itself, and that's, uh, that's obviously good spending by the government. Um, I'm not going to get into the weeds too much, but uh, I still, I work for Connexon now, which we're, we, we had a big, uh, we won in the RDOF uh, fund and uh, we're, we're continuing to deploy on co-op networks across the country. Uh, Stack Osage, Osage Valley, we're about to deploy out there. Um, but the, the thing about it, I think, is accountability is one of the big things that I see that's been missing. And you talk to a lot of providers um, and, you know, this is supposed to be served and they got money in the CAF auction or RDOF and they're still not seeing service. So we're getting some data on that to show where, you know, three, four years in, some of these locations that actually got money in the federal level uh, have got no service still. So I think going back to the data, we need data to know who's, who needs it, but we also need to make people accountable. If they're gonna take this money, you know, they better build it and they better do what they say. Otherwise, you know, we're gonna be back in the same hole one, one more time. Um, you know, I just, I echo the, the whole thing about what's good enough. We heard a lot of people say, you know, 25-3 is good enough. It's good enough for them. But, you know, for rural communities, it, it, it's like a have and have nots. It's not good enough. I mean, what we deploy has got to be ubiquitous. If the city has it, the rural folks should as well. Um, quality of life is not. 
based upon where you live. And so, so I think there's been a big, I think, bridge built so far, and I think there's a bit of a building spree going on, which is fantastic. Um, but all I all I kind of argue and echo is that we we just sort of uh, m whatever people deploy, a they do it if they're going to receive money, uh, and b I think you can't back a, a technology that could do something or it should be able to do something. It needs to be able to do it and 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 not you know be a hypothetical or, or in a lab or in a best case scenario. You know you you advertise a gig, you should be able to do a gig. So. Anyway, I'll get off my soapbox, but that's all I wanted to add. I actually, I actually do have one question for that. Somebody just texted, just texted me on consumer, on consumer protection. protection. So, so if, is, and this is, it sounds like, it sounds like maybe the right person to answer, answer this. If, if internet's being, internet's advertised, being advertised at a certain speed, speed and it's not, and it's not being delivered, are there any kind of consumer protections there? They're just like, well, it could if it was optical, but it doesn't here. So there's just the way it is. So there is some mechanisms in some of the funding uh, for RDOF and some other things where if you promised, uh, you know, gigabit, someone gets gigabit and you do your testing, your automated testing, um, if you, you fail that, there are some penalties, but that's so loose and um, to speak out of school, people know how to, providers know how to game that and test a certain way to be able to get the performance. So is there any protections? No, there isn't. It's kind of like an honesty model, really. Um, you know, best speeds up to, there's about a million disclaimers on most people's uh, websites on this is the best case scenario. So I think some accountability there, um, you know, I am I worked at IBM for nearly 10 years. I'm a data guy. Um, I think that is one of the most loosely sold products that I've seen that it could do this, but at the best of times, but what about eight o'clock at night when everyone's on there? You know, so we as providers, I, I am a provider. I mean, we need to be held accountable for that. Yeah, just to echo that, um, during high of the pandemic, I'm also vice chair of economic development. I started getting phone calls from people in my, my district in the city of Hannibal who had good internet normally, who didn't. And the kids were out, um, asked DED what's going on, and got an email back that 40 to 45 percent of all the bandwidth out there during business hours, eight to five, soaked up by Netflix and YouTube. And nobody saw that coming. So when we talk about speed, peak periods, or what have you, nobody, I mean, nobody anticipated that. So the, the whole resilience question, accountability is something that I think we need to deal with as policymakers as well. So thank you for that. Yeah, I just wanted to um, expand upon that. I think in terms of, you know, the previous question in terms of technology and being future-proof, uh, I, I haven't seen anything either that says, you know, the next new technology is X, except for 5G, and that's a whole other um, bag of worms. But I think really what we need to be thinking about is what speeds do we think is going to be future proof. And if on this conversation, if we're saying that 25.3 is really, well, on a really, really good day, conceivably, you could, um, if that's our, our, our threshold for what we're aiming for, um, our, our households now are going to be challenged with that. And so I think we need to really think about what um, speeds we're willing to accept with, uh, especially when we're going out taxpayer dollars to ensure that that's delivered. I think a second thing in terms of accountability, there are some states that are putting um, accountability measures into um, their, their grant initiatives, their funding initiatives. North Carolina is one that comes to mind. Um, and I could probably find a few others if you're interested, but that is something that once it gets deployed, they go out and they look and make sure um, that it was was built out where they said it was going to be built out. Some states are starting to put um, questions about pricing in there. Um, again, if we're using taxpayer dollars and then a network is built out that costs a hundred dollars a month at the starting plan, lots of Missouri families won't be able to cover that cost, and we don't have them um, connected. So, and we did in HB seventeen sixty eight last year enact a clawback provision in statute uh, for the state funds. So there are some accountability, accountability measures we've already taken. The question is a little different, uh, advertised fee versus deploying according to the funds. So there, there are two linked issues, but they're not quite identical. But, and we'd appreciate the, the accountability information that, that you have. Thank you. On the, on the accountability piece, I think as we participated in the broadband grant program, the first iteration of it, and, yeah, that's one thing that we'll, I'll compliment 
the state law, state statute, and the state broadband office. I mean, they went out of their way to make sure you know that that you know with requiring budgets and timelines and everything like that to be included in in the application. Um, they were they were. <laughs> Tim was very, very diligent about overbuilding, um, where you know the both on the application side, to where we were getting questions about projects that we had turned in because they were they had met some of those issues where it was in a served census block, but the area itself wasn't served, and so there was a threshold as an as an applicant we needed to get over, and the state was very diligent in making in, in checking that on the front end. And then the very good thing about the state program is there's a very robust challenge piece um, side to it as well. So, in fact, there was there was one there was one project that um, was applied for in an area where we were getting ready to build, and so that challenge process allowed us to say, you don't state you don't necessarily need to spend money there. We've got this private. You know, this private entity that's putting up 100% private funds to build it, kind of my point earlier about efficient use of resources, state resources, that freed up money to go elsewhere. And so they've been very, very diligent about that. And we would, you know, obviously encourage that to continue because those, those protections, when we're trying to focus all of our energy on those unserved areas, any way that you can save money through accessing private capital, is is going to do that and so just to just as a sort of a hat tip to what we already have right now so one and jeremy this may be a good question for you but we talk a lot about the economic uh, the return on investment on on this kind of on the broadband and what I keep hearing is it's seven to one, seven to one. That's the number that, that I read and see. And my, my curiosity, well, I've got a lot of questions about that, but one is, is there a difference between when we're talking about an urban setting and a rural setting when, when we're talking about the kind of economic impact that you're going to have? So I can answer the, the economic impact piece um, maybe in a slightly different way. So the, the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia recently published a study where they compared, they looked at labor market attachment. So do people have jobs? And if so, do they have a computer and an internet connection? And through that study, they were able to see direct correlations between having a job and having a computer and an internet. Now we don't know necessarily which drives which drives which, but we do know there's a correlation there. The study did go on without getting into all the details of it. I can send it to you. Um, it, it did go on to say that if we had universal access, if there's universal access policy that you know made sure people had access to both internet and a computer, that there would be 400,000 jobs created in the metropolitan areas of the country. It just looked at MSAs. They went on to look at what, um, by the MSA, what percentage of households have both an internet connection and a computer. And so out of the 376 metros, Missouri metros did not do that great. Uh, Columbia came in 37th. That was the only one that broke the top 100. Kansas City uh, and St. Louis were both mid-packed at 138 and 151. St. Joe, Jeff City, Cape Girardeau, Springfield, and Joplin were all 325 or lower on that score of 376 metros. Joplin came in, uh, which is 55 percentage of households having both internet and a computer. So. Um, we can't say for sure how much tax base is going to go up if everybody has a computer and an internet connection, but there is correlations there. There's also studies that have looked at um, correlations between population growth in rural communities and connectivity. And only, and they broke out 420 of the rural most counties in the country into five groups based on the degree of connectedness. The only group between 2010 and 2016 that saw population growth was that quintile that's the top 20% connected. And that 
those counties saw a seven and a half percent population growth, whereas the other one saw a negative or neutral growth. That's, that's incredible. And also, we have uh, another state rep that just showed up, so I'll give you a chance to introduce yourself. If you'd like. Good afternoon. Sorry, I'm late. My battery died in my car, so <clears throat> whatever pants and slacks I had that were clean are, none, are, are now, you know, I had to run home, change clothes, change cars, so I'm sorry about being late. But I'm Bill Kidd, uh, chair of utilities, um, and so I just live out in the eastern Jackson County, used to live here in Independence. Um, and so I'm very, very aware of the digital divide. Um, some of those numbers might be a little, um, I'm always hesitant when I hear Kansas City and, and everybody kind of lumped into that group because I can guarantee you I can take you out on Highway 24 and on one side of the road, <clears throat> I've got high-speed internet, I've got uh, you know uh, cable. Other side of the road, I've got two strings and a can or two cans and a string. Um, literally, the digital divide is across the street. And so <clears throat> even though it's Jackson County, my number one complaint in, in eastern Jackson County is the digital divide. Uh, my high school is suffering from it. Uh, the local library has to put up Wi-Fi out in the parking lots. So I'm, I'm going to preach a little bit here. But when everybody says, oh, Kansas City has it, well, maybe that way, but toward the eastern part of the county, it doesn't. And so I get real nervous when people say with well, Jackson County, you know, won't qualify or what he has the resources. That is not true. Parts of Jackson County do, but I would say if you're in anything outside of the city limits, good luck. And that's not a, an, an indictment of providers. There's just not enough density there to make it practical. So your response about jobs goes well beyond just the Kansas City area. It goes farther into eastern Jackson County, into Lafayette County, where we are stagnated. <clears throat> There's just not access there. My son's an insurance adjuster. I'm preaching now, folks. You gave me the mic. <clears throat> My son's an, an insurance adjuster. Okay. Good luck on some of those times when he has to download big files and build lots of pictures. Um, it, it, it can't do its job, or it takes twice as long, or he has to wait till 2 o'clock in the morning. And so it's you're looking at an economic impact, but there's more than just an economic impact to that. There's a lifestyle impact. There's a family impact um, to that whole deal. Uh, there's the ability to attract a new job. Let's say he, he owns a new, he, he's going to change companies, and they say, what kind of internet do you have? Well, technically on my contract, it says up to 10 megabits. In reality, if I get, if he gets one on a good day, then that's where it is. So no offense to the numbers, we want to make sure that when we look at those numbers that we are geographically looking at literally across the street from one another and I'll give the mic back maybe. If, if I could respond to that, um, I, I take no offense to those comments. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, a, a couple things to clarify there. The, um, the, the report that I was referencing only looked at MSAs, so we have to use those MSA numbers. And I, I will say um, that I, I, I agree with your, with your comments completely. Kansas City comes in mid-pack in the country. I think that's more of an um, indication that this isn't something that's just a Kansas City problem or a Missouri problem. Um, it's, it's, it's a relative problem. I will also say that um, there are huge opportunities um, for, for growing our rural communities if people can have the connections and the skills to work remotely. Uh, we've, we've learned this through the pandemic, as, as con uh, Representative Riggs was saying earlier. Um, there's a organization in Eastern Kentucky that does workforce training, and it's a region of the state where half of house, households make less than $28,000 a year. And over the last six years, well, six years ago, they started with a pilot to train to reskill 100 out of work coal miners in tech related remote work positions. Now, of course, they had to build out the, the broadband network to do it first. Um, they went through the program. 
Fast forward six years later, 3,400 people have gone through this job training. The average, they, they work from home, they work at a, um, a, a, a hub in, in town uh, for companies like um, Microsoft and Apple and big hotel chains doing tech support and customer service, making between, starting out between 14 and $20 an hour with healthcare and vacation. These are above median wage jobs in that rural community and the tax base is growing. So to your point, I wholeheartedly agree. We're about halfway done, so how about we take about a 10 minute break and get a chance to use the restroom, get a drink. Uh, so I think there's there's three topics of conversation that I would like to have before we call it a day. Uh, one is, you know, when we're expanding broadband and the providers are, are building and getting it to more people, what can the state do to either get out of your way or to make your life easier? Uh, the second piece is digital navigators. What do we need to do to make sure that people know about the resources that they have? And then the third piece is the interplay between the not-for-profits who are trying to provide internet and the service providers who are offering pretty good deals to people who need it. And then we'll wrap up with a catch-all to make sure everything that we needed to discuss, we, we got a chance to do so. So um, the first question I talked to some of the providers of the break uh, is, you know, make ready. W what can the state do to be um, to, to help you be proactive in that way? And I know there's some talk that Missouri is more expensive because we've got more rock and so on and so forth. So I'll, I'll just open it up and, and see where that goes. So I'll start off with this. So there would be an opportunity to do a joint trench to do joint trench where we could all go in at once. That would be very, very helpful. The rock is beautiful here. However, it's very expensive to build. <laughs> so if, if there's an opportunity where we could all go in at one time and split the cost, it would be more cost effective for all of the providers. And I would make the recommendation to go underground, mainly just because it's more consistent. You think about a Missouri ice storm, those poles go down. It stinks, and when you want your internet more than ever, so you can see the weather and see what's going on is in those tough weather times. And so I would just, if there's any kind of benefit to, to going underground versus the pole attachments would be really great. I think the other piece when you're looking at that that's important to, of note, at least for us, we make decisions on a national level of where we're gonna go out and build. And so when I mentioned to you in, a, in the sign conversation, it's three times more expensive for us to build in Missouri versus Minnesota because they do do joint trench in Minnesota. And here we haven't quite figured that out yet, to be frank. Um, What's the pushback? How, how come? Just cooperation. Quite frankly, it's cooperation to get it done. Builders will do it by a development. But as far as cities or utilities, there's been nothing to my knowledge that we've been able to break through. And we've been having conversations and to be honest with you, I'm not sure what the holdup is more than that. But if you could, if there's something facilitated by the state to push for something like that would be really great because then you're lowering the price, you're lowering the, you're evening the playing field regardless of location to build that it's the same price or closer to the same price as other parts of the country. So when you have bigger companies, I don't, it doesn't make sense for me that Minnesota should get more builds than Missouri should, because those are real discussions that happen in our, our camp, right? We talked about that second floor conversation. If we had something that would help even that playing field and pull down some of that cost for all of us, then we can get more build done. Because really what we're trying to do is find ways where we can make the money stretch further. We have one pot of money, just like everybody else does, and we want to find ways that we can get more effective with that spending. And so that allows us just to get to more places if we did a joint trench type initiative. So, I mean, what's what's a pushback you might hear? And, I, and I'm a little naive on this, so I, I apologize. But, no. you know, is it going to be utility provider that's offering the pushback? Or is it going to be a, a builder or the city? I mean, what... What group of people is it and what kind of pushback would you receive? So usually the pushback that we've had locally here is with the utility company, and I think it's more the coordination than what people want to take on because it is extra coordination to say, hey, all of your friends come build with us at the same time. <laughs> There's some extra work that goes with that. And I don't know that folks want the hassle is kind of the presumption that we're under. And so if there is a way to simplify that, would be great. The other piece is when we joint trench together, then when people come in and build later, you have less chance of fiber cuts because that also takes down people's service and it's expensive to come out and do, whether that's for commercial business or for residential. 
So that would be the other benefit to doing it that way. And you have the joint trenches in Minnesota? Yeah, Minnesota's joint trenches. Is, is there something that's statutory that allows that to be smoother, or is it just something where it's just the best practice and they're used to doing it? Yeah, I'm not, I don't handle Minnesota, so I'm not sure, but I suspect yeah. there must be some sort of uh, mandatory notification of all providers. I, I would assume I can. We can find out. Yeah, we can find out for you. I'll be honest. I, I don't work on the government affairs side of the business, but that would be one thing I would tell you. They do a nice job of partnering with us and the other providers of that up there. So we can find that out. How about charter spectrum in the back? You got anything to add in the make ready? Yeah, I think you know, we talked earlier at the first meeting um, this morning about this. Um, you know the. And when you start getting into the, just the, the nitty gritty of what a of what a build is, and you have to look and say, are we going to go aerial? Or are we going to go underground? Um, obviously, in some parts of the state, being underground is just it is even more expensive because of the the, the terrain. Um, and so then you're left with aerial, um, and you know that's that is that as well can be fairly cost prohibitive at times, you know, where you've got a pole every 80, 70, 80 yards that needs to be replaced um, for whatever reason. That could be uh, it's too short. Data has to be so far away from power. Uh, there could be uh, issues about just number of connections. The, the pole can't. It's got, you know, the capacity for four connections and the fifth attacher comes to it and says, well, this there's a new pole that's needed. Um, you get into issues there between that new attacher and the pole owner because the way that it typically works is that new attacher is paying for the entire cost of the pole. Um, and they don't ultimately end up owning it. It's the, it's the former owner that owns it still. Um, and so that becomes a, a challenge to work through uh, at times. When we come to a come to a pole that needs to be replaced, it's about ten thousand dollars is what we will budget uh, on a project. And so I know I had a I had a state rep from Jefferson County approach me about you know, getting service to an area, and it was a five mile build, and three and a half of it was going to be aerial, and we were going to have to replace every single one of the poles along the way, and so. You know, it was going to take for it to make anywhere close to financial sense to build. It was going to take a a customer contribution of half a million dollars in order to build. I mean, it's just given the the few that the how undense the area was and how far it was and and the terrain that we had to go over. So, you know, when you start actually getting into some of these things about what are we going to fund, what are we not going to fund, that's one that 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 issue between pole attachment or pole replacement. Can those those situations can go can, can go smoothly at times. Other times they can't. But anything the state can do to help incentivize that process to go smoother, I think, would be um, a good step. Um, particularly given you know just the cost. I mean, if there's money available, um, that is something that could be very targeted that I think could have. A lot of it, a lot of benefit to rural broadband expansion, um, given Missouri's terrain, is just helping with replacement costs. It has the benefit of helping broadband. It has the benefit of getting new poles to the utilities as well. You know, it really could be a win-win. What about private, private, private public partnerships? In other words, uh, right now you're looking at you start doing that build. <clears throat> uh, I mean, I had. Comcast look at a little half mile run and it was like $100,000. Just <clears throat> poles are already there, pole attachments are there. It's just run the cable and go. Hey, you would think, you know, but by the time you looked at the, the cost, it was pretty high. Um, and so you're looking at it from a company point of view that says, well, that's the company. Um, whoever is going to provide this, do that. But what about public part, private partnerships where we go in with the city of Independence or Eastern Jackson County or the fire district or the library board or who, whoever makes sense. And we use public funding in bonding type of situations to come along and now and say, okay, you want to put it in, let's, let's see your bid. 
Are you going to be the provider for this? Are you the one that's going to do this? What are the performance characteristics? What it's going to look like? How long is it going to take? And so instead of you being the sole provider, in other words, we get away from this territorial issue that we keep running into from the 1940, 50 telco era, and we just say, I don't care who the current provider is. I'm going to make a lot of people mad when I say that <clears throat> because we've got to get this done. This, I was just had talk with the mayor. We all agreed. This is 1930. Rural electric and, and you know electricity to grandma and grandpa's house in the middle of nowhere makes economically no sense. So if I look at your scenario, that makes economically no sense to me to run a half a mile in rough terrain in southeastern Missouri through rock country. Makes no sense at all. Well, we're going to do it. Grandma and grandpa got electricity, and so we have to change that mindset of. Well, you're going to be the one doing that into a different mindset that says, we're going to do this. It's 1930. Grandma needs electricity. She needs to turn the power on to see the light bulb. If we don't, we're having not only a digital divide, we're going to have an education divide, we're going to have an economic divide that's going to continue to magnify. Imagine now your house without electricity. Imagine that. We wouldn't even think of that nowadays. But that's where we're going with this. And so part of what I, I've talked with uh, Representative Riggs is that I, I know one of his passions is we got to get this done. And so for everybody sitting in this room, I'm going to chastise you a little bit now and not come up with creative ideas. I mean, creative ideas. Let's get away from the 1930 telcos, the 19, all the restrictions. Just get away from the problems we have in the capital, the problems with everything else, and start looking at going to how do we get this done? It's 1930, grandma needs electricity. It's 19, it's 2021, 2022. We're in a, a, we have a pandemic. People got to get to their jobs. Are you going to tell them, no, you can't turn electricity on? So I'm not going to chastise you a little bit, but be, I'm trying to just emphasize that if we sit here and this, if, if I know him, I know he's going to drive it like mad, okay, which is good, that if we don't think out of the box about this, then I know he, I know him, especially, we're going to leave you behind. We're going to try at least to go around you and to do it because grandma needs electricity. I can't be more passionate about that. I'm preaching again. I'm sorry. But I see this every day in the lives of people. I can't imagine my grandma not having electricity. I can't imagine my grandkids not getting on the Internet. Okay. Same thing. It's economically biased and wrong. And, and we've got to overcome that. Now, unfortunately, we need... Feds. We need lots of fed. But in the meantime, think out of the box. That's what I'm asking. I know that's what he's asking. Think out of the box. A caveat Sorry. to your point of getting people there, if we could make it easier for all us to go in together, it would also be more affordable because you'd have more competition. Yeah, he and I have talked about, I, I, we don't care private public partnerships, yeah. multiple partnerships. Maybe you take a section, maybe your company takes a section. Um, you know, a fire district, a library district, I don't know, Unionville, who knows what it's gonna take in Unionville. You know, totally different than Independence. I just saw her numbers, amazing numbers. There's no reason $75 million with a four or five year turn on investment. That shouldn't happen. Other than the fact that we're in the way. And, and we got to get everybody out of the way. If you start thinking, changing the mindset from, we wouldn't do this to grandma in 1930. Don't do it to your grandkids or your kids now or your future generations of kids. It's going to impact them in ways we've never thought of. Sorry, I'm, I'll pass the plate here in a little bit. I have the microphone. I just want to... <laughs> you, want got, well, you, want you want two? Uh, yeah, can I have two? Uh -oh. All right. Um, and, and I didn't mean to speak for you, but I guess the uh, internet connection isn't very good. Um, 
So let me just share a little bit of what Representative Kidd is referencing. Um, as I mentioned in our meeting earlier today, the Independence Chamber of Commerce took this on as an initiative to investigate what it would take to provide municipal broadband um, to all of our customers that are in IPL uh, territory. Um, and this is just one report from one consultant. This isn't, you know, but it just gives a little bit of a snapshot. Um, so based on the information that they provided us, um, we've got just over 30,000 poles um, that are owned by IPL in the city of Independence. So that's, you know, our, our property, that's public infrastructure that we own, we control. Um, there's um, 84.4 miles of existing fiber. Um, that's 798 total primary miles of fiber that is already existing. Um, there's, um, to get down to, you know, some assumptions, if we were assuming a loan rate of 3% over 30 years um, with a take rate of 30%, uh, those are some of the things that we're looking at. We need to construct, we need to construct about 1,400 total miles of new fiber build to reach every home. And I mean, if that's what we're talking about is getting electricity to grandma, I mean, that's, that's what we're uh, talking about. Uh, this would predict uh, about 36 months of construction Operating costs year one, 540,000, year five, 3.9 million, year 10, 4.1 million. Um, monthly cash flow, if we, you know, for the operator would be about just over $750,000. So this would be net income positive in year three, cash flow positive in 48 months, according to this report. That requires a capital expenditure of. $75 million. That's the dollar amount for the city of Independence IPL territory that already has all this infrastructure. <laughs> so when you start talking about going into areas that don't have that kind of infrastructure, that don't have any uh, current fiber, um, I mean, you can imagine how that number would just go through the roof. Um, but, you know, just as I said, this isn't what we're doing, this isn't, you know, but, but this is just some research that we've conducted and give us an idea of what the cost would be to do what Representative Kidd is talking about. You got 75 million? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to your point, this is, you know, and there's a lot more information that I, that can be shared um, that gets into much more detail. But to be net income positive in year three on a $75 million investment is pretty attractive. Well, the only thing I'll say is I sat in on those and there was nothing for low income housing and they were doing it off of an $80 gig price point, which is more expensive than any of the other yeah, the right. I mean, there's a lot more, obviously, that would need to be understood, but just to give you an idea. Now, I understand all those numbers change when you start getting out into rural Missouri and, you know, all that changes. But again, if we can think of a box about how we start to put those partnerships together. Um, and quite frankly, I, I know we're going to run into areas that it makes it, it will never make sense. Um, and I don't have an answer for that. I wish I'd sit up here and tell you I do, but we are going to run into areas that, you know, you've got one house in every mile and it's straight up and straight down. Um, but if we don't do it for the other 98%, then Missouri's going to, we're going to be left behind. Uh, there's no reason why we could not attract people to this state and have a huge economic development by having a, a, a robust broadband infrastructure information access. We're the central United States. We have everything that we need here except the connection, in my opinion. 
I, the only thing I'd add is since we, we do have limited resources, it may seem like we don't get the Fed money, but eventually that money is going to go away. It's very important that this money is spent where it's needed and not in areas that already have one or two or even three broadband providers in place. Well, part so, of that is looking at, I, I hate it, but looking at census tracts. Um, you know, part of that is looking at how the density is and who and what and where. And so when I sit here and say, oh, we're just going to go do it, I'm an engineer also. And so there's a lot of that I go, yeah, but we haven't figured that part out yet. Well, Missouri actually in, in statute already, they, they have a great challenge provision that addresses that. So, uh, right. as I said earlier, that what, what was passed four years ago is really it's, it's a bill that I've, I've shared with other states because I really think it is the gold standard when it comes to, you know, how this broadband issue should be addressed at a state. My, state problem, level. my frustration, but it hasn't is, been funded. My problem I was just going to say my frustration is funding and then what I call selective funding. You know, if you're not the one selected to read the funding, that funding doesn't exist for you. And so we get caught up in this selective funding. Now, I can realize that we, you know, in the practicality, we have to have priorities about how we're going to roll this out and, and where and what. But I want us out of the way so that if the mayor comes out with his great idea to do this, why are we in her way of going out and bonding or raising funding in whatever way that she can raise or combining why do we restrict that why do we restrict her ability to do business in 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 a meaningful way that makes business sense and doesn't care about democrat republican second floor fourth floor i said it don't care if it makes sense to go get $75 million and they can do it in a private public partnership or she can do it in bonding or, or whatever, please do. I'm sorry. I guess, I guess I'm, I'm fairly new to this industry, but I, I'm, I'm not aware of any restrictions that would prevent them from doing that. I believe there are. There certainly is there are some private the city public of, the city partnership. Of Springfield, the city of Springfield is doing, is doing that very thing. So I guess I, I'm, I'm just not familiar with with what the restrictions are because there are cities that have already done that. As far as I know, there are some restrictions. What I'm wanting to remove is that we don't, it's not just a city, it's any taxing entity. So libraries, fire, I don't, I don't care. So it's just not a, you know, if Independence needs to go with you know, Fort Osage Fire Protection District that needs to go with Mid-Continent Public Library, yeah taking all those restrictions away uh, about how and, and what and if they want to need to combine that with federal money or grants or state money or private money even yeah i think that's kind of to our conversation earlier it's a it's a it's the most important conversation is what the best resource best use of the state's resources are i mean We've we've got a great broadband grant program that targets money to areas that don't don't have access. You know, we talked earlier about some legislation that was sort of pushed late last session that urged the local funds that are coming in to work through the state broadband grant program so that even that local money there was coordination between locals and the state to make sure that the money's going to unserved areas. Um, you know, the census block is, is I think, something that is, is outdated, and that's why working with the state broadband grant program as a template, there are ways around that to where you can target it to areas. There's, we talked about earlier about the, about the, they're very diligent about making sure the areas are not served. You know, those are things that I, I think are, are important, and if we could figure out a way to just help coordinate kind of this idea of coordination earlier, you know, I think that's one of the things that we're doing. We, we were, you know, we're, there, are, there are a number of counties out there that are, that are looking at, you know, RFPs to try to serve unserved areas. You know, I don't know that they feel, feel fully confident in what they're doing because this is all new with them. And so creating that dialogue between the states so that they can say, we want to spend money on broadband, but we want to make sure it matters how do we get it to the areas that don't have it? Where do I start? You know, having that resource to them, I think, could be 
really helpful. And I think for the state's purposes, it really helps you target that money to areas that need it the most in order to get that access out as far as we can. And then all of these other conversations, you know, the adoption and the education stuff, you know, we need to be doing that going along, but we can't forget that there are those areas that just, I mean, we, I've sat in a, sat in a meeting with one city and, you know, they're going, they're talking through some things that they want to, that they may want to do internally. And there are people showing up complaining about, you know, well, I've got, I've got gigabit service, but it goes out every once in a while. And then I go to Bowling or County and I meet with that task force that's looking at, that's looking at broadband. And those people would give two arms and a leg to have internet service that goes out once a month, you know, because they don't have anything. So we're just, we're just a very diverse state from that aspect. And so, you know, what, what can we do? That's, that's one thing I would just encourage that if we're going to spend this money, it needs to continue to be, be targeted the areas that we've targeted for the last five years. Well, that's, um, that's one thing I could jump in. I mean, census block is in the way. At the federal level, we know that. Uh, that's one of the, the reasons we emphasize the state fund because it's not in the way with the state fund. We do have a robust challenge process. Everybody agrees. We don't want overbill. We want basically to get the access out to begin with. Um, also, some legislation basically allowing municipalities to create their own broadband districts. I have language that would have said political subdivisions so counties could do the same thing. Uh, then make it across the finish line, but we can come back and revisit that. So, you know, I'm just trying to look down the road as, as far as where the federal dollars are coming into. Uh, counties could be a huge player in this space. I have one in my district that is. Um, they asked me, what do I think? I, well, I'm reading the guidance that says broadband's a priority. And <coughs> census block knocks them out every single time. Every single time. They're not even in the conversation with Fed stuff, but they're in it for the state. But the county, you know, had the money, CARES Act, they put it out there. They're going to do it again with ARPA. Same thing, Rawls County to my south. They've been at this for a long time. That They were shovel-ready when shovel-ready was a thing. And they've been doing nothing but broadband ever since. So there are some practitioners out there that are doing it right. Uh, we just basically need to highlight those stories, let folks know, hey, there's help on the way. Uh, the feds have money. It's flowing in. ARPA, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to stack that with other benefits. But the fact of the matter is... It's available for broadband. I've looked at the interim guidance. I've talked to folks in D.C. That's not going to change. It's going to say broadband is a priority. The new infrastructure package, whatever it looks like, will have another broadband piece to it. We don't know what that's going to look like. But seeing some pretty encouraging signs at the federal level, getting away from census block, more towards community, which makes a lot more sense. Have, you know, lighter touch as opposed to, you know, get this in the ground by December 31st of 2020. It's uh, 2024 into 2026, which I, I think is a much longer fuse, much more practical for folks who are looking at construction delays of a year, back order, you know, materials, 18 months, some of them. So, I mean, we're in a good place, I think, with the feds. It's just a question of how do we translate that into <coughs> more tools in our toolbox here for our economic developers, our schools, uh, and, and so on. So the, the two buckets... Um, our folks used the, the first was online education. They basically hired hardwired a, a, a rural uh, campus. Uh, the second was telemedicine. Uh, what's that? that's the evergreen issue? We, we all know that's not going to go away. And I think for quality of life issues, that's everybody across the state. In 2016, the state authorized everyone as an end user of, of telemed resources. Okay, that was before any other broadband stuff came out. People understood that. Some amazing work being done. University of Missouri uh, comes to mind immediately. So there, there's some great synergies already out there. But I want to back up a little bit. The, the, the broadband districts and municipalities is based on something that happened in Vermont. I've talked to people in Vermont, it happened too. And the reason for that was they had a provider fell flat on their face, and they knocked out basically the entire state for the 10-year period from, from that particular federal uh, funding source. It's like, well, you know, that was just out of necessity. Is it a good tool? Yes. Can folks do that? Absolutely. Uh, same thing, which we're going to try and do that with counties as well. Uh, but, you know, to tell the county folks, there are only so many road graders you can buy. Invest in, invest in people. You can invest in things all day long, but investing in people, that's where, you know, the young people who go away aren't coming back and we cry about it every day in rural. Why aren't they coming back? Because they don't have broadband internet. 
and they're not coming back if you don't have it. So that, that's a little speech I give to folks who come to my house. Well, what can we do? Well, <laughs> get in the game. You know, we're all out there doing it, all hands on deck. What's your excuse? Well, it's a lot of money. Well, the feds are bringing you a lot of money. Use it. If it's not stapled to something else, slap the name broadband on it and get it out there. So sorry, I'm preaching too, and Bill's contagious today. But, you know, and I wanted to drill down a little bit further. And we're talking about the future, and Kristen has some really good material as far as, you know, the workforce development piece, but what, what the economy is going to look like, you know, five, ten years down the road. We talk about the broadband piece. We need to be talking about the societal piece and what the workforce itself is going to be. How many of these jobs that we see today are going to go away in the next five, ten years and be replaced by something that you have to have digital literacy or you're not going to have a job? So, if, sorry to get into that. But. No, um, thank you. I think the battery might be dying. Okay. It looks more. No. Keep trying. There you go. It's flashing a lot of colors. Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Kristen. I'm with Goodwill. And I think the thing that I want to add to this conversation is that the internet and broadband, they're tools. So it's, it's not enough from our perspective to just give more access to the internet and to devices. We also need to make sure that people know how to use it and how we get to digital literacy and digital skills training is related to everything. So Representative Riggs talks about the workforce. It's a huge workforce and economic development issue. Um, with the pandemic in particular, people are demanding to work remotely. Um, employers are going to need to adjust to that. And then folks are going to need the ability the you know, the affordability, the speed, the bandwidth, the device, and the skills to be able to meet their employer needs to work from home. But um, when we also think about not just the jobs of today, but the jobs of tomorrow, um, one of the things that Goodwill is really looking at is technologies like automation, robotics, 3D printing, um, artificial intelligence, those technologies are changing work. And how that relates to, to broadband and digital skills is that that's another industrial revolution that is going to change the types of jobs and job skills that are in demand. So there are some really good studies out of like McKinsey and Company, for example, that say that 54 million jobs in the United States will be eliminated by 2030 just due to automation. And the types of jobs that are going away are those um, rote, uh, repetitive type jobs that are often held by folks with limited work experience, limited education, they're low income folks. Uh, and these individuals need an opportunity to upskill and where they need to upskill is digital literacy so that they can have the ability to transition to a job of the future rather than becoming unemployed. So that that's just one piece, but I think that even in the status quo, um, access and digital skills are really important. So um, some of the data that we have shows that about 82% of what's considered middle skill jobs, it, that requires a baseline of digital literacy. So if you don't have experience and knowledge in how to use a device, at, at, and I'm not talking about like a certificate in CompTIA, you know, do you know what a mouse is? Do you know how to open a Word document? Basic digital skills, um, if you don't have that, you're locked out of jobs that can support you and your family. Um, and when you look at the types of jobs that are being posted, you know, 38% of overall job postings um, are digital middle skill jobs. So they're also in demand from employers. So if, if folks don't have those skills, then they don't have the ability to access jobs to support themselves and their families. And I think that that's important both from 
the, the workforce perspective, but also it comes back to um, adoption, which we were talking about earlier, because income is the number one correlator with adoption. So if, if you are struggling to decide whether you're going to pay for rent or buy food, you're not signing up for internet service, which means that when you go home from your job or your kid has to, you know, do school from home, it, it, you know, it's a ripple effect where you can't file your taxes online and you can't apply for jobs. And um, so I, I think that um, just from the workforce perspective, it's a big deal to look at access, certainly, um, but also the skills that folks need, whether they're working in their home or going into the office, we need to build in training as we also build in additional access and additional speed so that folks know what to do with the tools that we'll be providing them with these funds. Uh, help me in my ignorance. This is you know, sometimes you're in a, a level where I'm not in your job, in your business, and so I'm not aware and it becomes, you know, I'm not trying to be insulted. I'm ignorant about how and what. And so for me, it was a shock to say that, I mean, I look at my grandkids and they, I, I say, here's my phone, fix it. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, that you, you said, you know, a, a mouse and how to do those things. I'm curious as, out of coming out of high school right now that that's not a absolutely primary skill uh, would be computer literacy and, and so I'm you know, ignorant and shocked about that secondly community college I know I've talked to a lot of our community college here because it's uh, a big supporter of driving education to the edge um, and so I have a hard time understanding only because I'm not where you are and I haven't seen it that in eight years time that we are going to still be in a situation where someone is not computer operational literate and help me understand that because right now you can't do anything that I'm hardly aware of um, that you, you don't require some kind of access either on your phone or and so I'm having a hard time correlating that I see us taking and doing community college education, training, and all those other things. High school, Votech, I'd say Votech, I'm a Votech graduate, so whatever they call that now. Um, those kind of skills are integrating into that. And and so I'm having a difficult time correlating eight years from now that we're still where you said, and no offense, no, not at all. I'm just not educated in that. Yeah, so I, I think, um, Goodwill serves individuals who are underemployed, unemployed. They're typically adults. So the common person who's coming to us for support in earning and keeping employment is not a college graduate. They probably don't have a high school diploma or GED at all. Um, and a lot of the folks that we're serving are between 45 and 65. So they didn't grow up in with the digital devices. Um, so we're trying to upskill a generation that didn't grow up with the internet or computers at all. But there are five generations in the workforce. So I think that it's important to look at and level the playing field for all the folks that want to contribute to jobs and, and earn a paycheck and support themselves and their families. Um, and, and a lot of folks are um, at risk of becoming unemployable or having their position eliminated if they don't have the opportunity to upskill. And, and so I think that there's just different populations um, that are impacted than, than others. Um, I would also say that um, not everyone has the same access to a phone in general. So, you know, you can hand your grandkids a phone, but some people don't have a phone at all. They don't have a computer. So a lot of the people who come in to work with us, one of the first things we're doing is setting them up with an email address. They don't have one um, because they they don't know how to set it up and, and they haven't, um, you know, they might not even think that it's critical. Would you see part of this as an ancillary to out to the build out, the physical build out that we also then take a 
percent of that or a piece of that over onto the social side and say, <laughs> this is where we need now. Uh, and because I can see us looking at doing something like that, where we take a, a piece of the bill, small piece, but we say, okay, we need a workforce development in three years, four years, this is going to be the, the trend. And we start taking a piece of that now to utilize that tool that we have, because it's like, again, you're right, if we don't utilize the tool, it doesn't matter. Yes. So, would you see this all coupled together then is an integrated deal, not just physical hard band, broadband build out, but the Absolutely. whole integration into all of that? Yes, I think that's a really good question. When, when Goodwill thinks about the digital divide, we think about three different legs of the stool. So there's the access, the actual fiber. There's the device. Do you have a, you know, a phone or a computer? But then there's also the skills to leverage those tools. So I, I think it's important to keep in mind that a lot of the folks that we're talking about, the people across the street, um, or, or those folks that don't have the same level of connectivity, um, they are probably, you know, just statistically more likely to be low income. So there was a study done by um, Dr. Horgan and the Kansas City Public Library just a couple years ago that showed that of households that are making $20,000 or less, um, only about 57% of them have adopted broadband. Uh, and so if we're giving access to folks that are maybe a little bit older or don't have experience in utilizing devices at all, um, giving them the ability to connect with a human to train them in how to utilize those devices um, would impact everything. It would impact, you know, a, a person's ability to log into a telehealth session effectively or a person's ability to make a resume and then send that to an employer or a student's ability to ask their parent for help with homework. I, I think that um, that like navigation and training component will be critical for ultimate success because you can say maybe 10 years down the line that you know, we increased access in these various aspects of the state, but if people aren't utilizing that tool to the maximum ability for their work and their quality of life, then arguably, I, I don't know that we accomplished the goal. Say no. Something just to our Internet Essentials program actually does offer classes for folks with digital literacy. A little, a little closer to the mic. Oh, sorry. Is that close enough? So one piece that I just caught what you were saying I would like I to highlight is, <laughs> Andy, can you hear me just, just fine? Um, we actually offer digital literacy classes for any of our Internet Essentials folks. So if they're on that program through us, they can take classes and we can help with that. The other piece, too, is the device, because it's not only do you have to have internet, but whether it's a cell phone or a desktop or a laptop or an iPad, whatever it might be, we do offer for $149. You can get a desktop or a laptop through that program, so you can get a subsidized rate on a computer. It would be something, so that might be just something to share with you to help. I know we've done some different partnerships with Goodwill in the past. It might be something we could speak with offline. I think that's something, going back of how we think outside of the box to make it happen, of how do we... All of us have some type of programs, all of the major providers. How do we help promote all of the offerings better? Just as a solution for us to think about, I'm sure Charter and AT&T have something similar through their different programs, but how do we get the word out? We can advertise, but if we're doing sure, online advertising, that the folks that you're talking about probably aren't seeing it. And so how do we get smarter about how do we re reach those folks in those communities? So we would just add, hey, we do offer something and we've, if you got any ideas how to help, I'd be interested to hear them. And that and, might be good for you guys, too. Yeah, and, and real quick, Leslie Scott from Digital Literacy had her hand up for for a while, and she may have something to add to this, too. So, Leslie, are you still there? I am. Um, I just put something in the chat just related to the workforce development <coughs> conversation. The National Skills Coalition um, sent this out on the um, National uh, Digital Inclusion Alliance listserv, if you're not... Uh, on that list, sir, I, I highly suggest you um, join it. So much great um, conversation and resources 
come through that listserv. Um, so there are some fact sheets um, there uh, that are broken down by um, by industry. And and just one quick comment to the um, epiphany that that not everyone um, coming out of uh, out of school now is is equipped. I think you know one of the things in in the digital uh, literacy space and, and more so in the digital equity space um, that we talk about is is moving kids from being consumers to producers. And so, you know, yeah, you may be able to uh, watch a YouTube video, but, you know, can you make one? You may be able to play a, a video game, but can you make one? And so, um, you know, there's a, a, a huge equity gap in, in that skill set. There are organizations here locally like Esteem Village and, um, you know, others that are, that are working to close that gap. But... Um, I think we'd be surprised at some of what we would consider uh, more of the, the workplace uh, skills that are lacking um, for, for those digital natives. Excellent point on the difference between consumer and producer. I had not crossed that line. So That's representative. <laughs> You, I know, have been to William Christman High School and seen the facility that they have um, to teach kids about being producers and not consumers. Um, I'm a, I don't want to speak for the independent school district and their um, their academies and their pathways. But you're going to. But I don't good. have they're information excellent. currently, but that's very low enrollment in that program, surprisingly. You'd be, I mean, I was very surprised to learn how few of your students, relatively speak, like, speaking, choose that as their, uh, you know, career college pathway. Because we all know, um, you know, I have two teenage children and the amount of time that they spend um, on the internet, in, using apps, you know, gaming, all that what, streaming services so that's just a, I mean I would be interested and I'm sure you would too to talk to Dr. Hurl and see what the participation is but that's an incredible facility that they were able to build and it's pretty underutilized I'm, you know there's been a lot of discussion um, about what, how are those facilities able to be used after four o'clock in the afternoon when all the kids clear out? Um, because, you know, they do have incredible, and I'm, this is just one example. I'm sure there's many, many others across the state um, that the equipment is there, the facility is there, but there's not as much demand as we might think for um, kids wanting I mean, they want to be consumers. <laughs> they don't necessarily want to be uh, producers. So I think that that's uh, important to realize is even when you do have that available, how many kids are really finding a way to participate in it. And part of it is what they're exposed to. If they don't know any engineers, if they don't know any computer programmers, if they haven't had any exposure, um, to those types of careers, um, that's not something they necessarily choose. And I've, you know, asked the superintendents and all, Fort Osage Independence, I mean, all have great programs available. It's like, what kids choose? Well, it's like anything else. They choose what their friends are doing. <laughs> you know, they try, to, they want to be in the same programs their kid, their friends are in. Um, so it would be interesting for you and I to get some updated information about how popular that is in the high school program. Yeah, because I had not drawn the connection, but it's funny that you and you say producer versus consumer, and you talk about computer literacy, I'm thinking, all right, there's Amazon, click, okay, ordered that, I got that, uh, PayPal, I got this, you know, oh, there's YouTube, uh, but that's not a production. I'm not sitting there, you know, doing work at the office or doing something, and so I was confusing, I had those still well, I know how to use a mouse. Click, I uh, just ordered that, you know. 
Um, but um, so excellent points. And I would like to go see that because my, one of my questions I wasn't going to ask here was how do we get people to choose to go do that? Jeremy and then Tony, I see you after that. So I was just going to put some numbers to some of what Kristen said. So um, uh, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, which Le Leslie Scott mentioned, um, they just put out a report. And as of June of 2021, there were 137,000 job openings in Missouri that required digital skills. So that's not necessarily coding. It's using calendaring functions like Outlook. It's using Word. It's using Google <coughs> Docs. Um, and right now, there are 53,000 unemployed Missourians that lack the digital skills needed for those jobs. So if we could empower them with some of those skills, uh, we can get them those jobs. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a four-year degree. It doesn't have to be a two-year program even. Um, programs like, like Goodwill um, are, is one example that's had a real um, success in moving path people from underemployment, low income, into um, occupations that can earn a, a, a decent living. Something else I wanted to comment on is the, the, the question or suggestion of should we parse out some of this um, broadband funding for digital training or access? And um, I think that would make a lot of people happy. Um, I think that money always makes everybody happy. Well, it, it does, but also um, doing it that way is going to ensure that you have more people sign up, um, which is going to reduce the cost for the providers. Um, and it also is going to improve that economic benefit to the state. The, the concept uh, that some are doing, and, and Leslie Scott could probably speak um, greatly to this, is a concept of digital navigators that are being um, funded in, in different parts of the country and essentially a digital navigator is someone who helps some helps well let me say this folks that tend to not have the internet um, that don't tend to have lots of money don't al also are the people that don't have lots and lots of time to try to compare plans and try to find the plan that's best for them um, and uh, and they don't necessarily have the skills to really always shop around or to even find out that Goodwill or the library or the university extension can give them some of that training so that they can um, age in place and uh, communicate with their doctors via telemedicine and that they can, uh, we, we know that with the pandemic, isolation has um, wreaked havoc on people's mental health. And so having them able to stay in contact with their friends and family at a distance, um, improving their, their life outcomes are all things that are great that um, those digital navigators um, can, can do. And, and I think Leslie's done work very similar to that with the emergency broadband benefit. And so a question I've looping back a little bit was, you know, get these providers who are offering pretty, pretty fair deals for people that that, that you know, unfair and reduced lunch, and then you're providing all these great services to the same group of people. Is there anything that the state could do to help make sure that we're getting as much yield out of that as we can? Okay. So one thing I was going to say is that not everybody who has internet lives in a community where there's internet available um, that might qualify for one of those plans has a plan offered in their community or they may not know about it if it is there. Um, also, I think we need to consider that it's typically, um, you know, if you qualify for free and reduced lunch, um, there's a lot of people that make too much money for free and reduced lunch for whom 100 or $120 a month for an internet plan is not something that they can afford. So is there options to expand um, those qualifications? Something else to think about, um, going back to, to your comments, sir, on being creative and how we do this. You know, we used to, the way we funded uh, telephone rollout into areas that were unprofitable is everybody paid a little extra per month, regardless of where you lived. Uh, we don't do that with broadband. And so, you know, are there some ways that we can make it so that, um, that grandma can have broadband even though she only makes $35,000 a month and therefore too much money for some of the 
the lower income plans. They handed me one. Yeah, I, I would echo what Jeremy said, and I, I think that a lot of this is, and it was kind of mentioned earlier around like collaboration. I think that there are a lot of resources and it's difficult for each service provider to be an expert in all of those resources. Um, people know what they know, uh, and they're also navigating pretty large caseloads, typically. So Goodwill relies on our partners a lot of time, like PCs for People or other organizations that um, can help get access to a device, for example. So I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say that PCs for people would sell a computer for like $50. Um, that, so there are these other um, entities with whom we partner to try to piece together the most holistic service for each person who walks through our doors based on how they come in. Um, in terms of how the state could help with that, um, beyond what Jeremy said, I, I think about anything that we can do to centralize and consistently update a resource database, you know, and that goes back to some of the da data points that we were making earlier, you know, how do we know where folks can access and, and what providers serve different places and what could, what would they really have to pay if they signed up? And how do we integrate the, the federal or whatever, the state or other resources that might help them for three to six months, but then we want to make sure that they can stay on afterward. So I think it's just a complex system, um, like most things. Um, and anything that we can do to centralize um, and promote outreach and updating the, the resources that are available um, would be helpful for the folks that we serve. And Tony, I, I left you hanging there. I apologize. That's okay. I, I think that uh, first I wanted to uh, applaud our, our colleague from Goodwill, who I, start, I think started a terrific conversation here, and then I've got a resource to offer. The, the conversation, uh, I think she pointed out, there's learning by being in a classroom and listening, and then there's learning by doing and practicing. And if you don't have the tools to be able to, to practice at home, you're at a disadvantage. And then the conversation about consumer versus producer is right on point. So for example, Leslie mentioned our, our friend and collaborator, uh, William Wells at Aisteen Village, which is a local STEM program after school and weekends. And um, what they do is they, they train young people in these digital skills. And then as very good engineers always do, they give them a problem to work on. Can you now take that skill and do something? Can you solve a problem? And so one of the things we're trying to do is map all levels of digital skills training, as many as we can find. And we built this Missouri Broadband Resource Rail, the university did, just for this kind of thing. So the resource navigator I mentioned, you can click a button that says digital skills training, and it'll pull up a lot of profiles of organizations offering that, but not right now we only have a fraction of them. And it's pretty easy to go into that and answer a few questions and say, my organization offers this. Now we're looking in particular for free and low cost uh, effort. It also has a geographical filter. So if you're looking for someplace you can go within X miles, it'll do that for you. And so I'm gonna put the link in here to that part of the resource rail. And I, I you know, if you know anybody, who's offering digital skills training, whether it's basic or more advanced and more projects based and producing all of that, you'd have an opportunity to fill in, here's what we do so that people can navigate straight to you. So I would, I would encourage you to use that. Then Jeremy, we hit on this a little bit, but you were talking about digital navigators earlier. I'd be curious if Share more about that. Yeah, so um, I'm trying to see if Leslie Scott's on the line still. Um, if she is, I think she could. Um, I am. I think I think Leslie could be um, speak to it from a more direct perspective. Leslie, do you want to talk about some of the work that you've done around um, EBB expansion enrollment? Sure. So um, 
I mean, first of all, we've had the Internet Access Support Program. Again, um, that was funded um, through Johnson County CARES Act money and then also a philanthropic fund called the COVID, COVID Relief Fund, which, um, which covered uh, nine counties, um, the same as the, the Mid-America Regional Council um, metro counties. And um, so we've done some, some fundamental work, which is, um, you know, just basically, as I mentioned um, in my initial comment, helping people pay for their, their internet bill, but getting caught up um, because if you're behind and we give you $75, but you owe you know, uh, 157. It, it it's not. It's just good money after bad, um, because you're you're going to end up getting disconnected anyway. Um, so the other things that have happened, sort of organically, as I also mentioned earlier, um, you know, we're pointing out things on people's bills that they they have noticed before. So again, when they signed up. Um, you know, the, uh, the better deal was explained to them and, and, and they, they chose that. So um, the better deal isn't necessarily the lower cost, however. So, um, you know, if you get, um, if you decide to get a bundle um, because it's going to lower your internet access and that's the, really the thing that you're, um, you're interested in getting, um, you may end up you know, paying a hundred and some dollars every month when, you know, you, you could have gotten away with much, much, with much less. So granted, you, the cost of your internet service would have gone up, but your overall bill would have gone down. Um, so we're pointing out some of those things. Um, we're also helping, helping people, um, you know, find, find lower cost services if that's something that's available to them. Um, so we look up their address and, and we analyze um, the, uh, the plans that are available uh, by the ISPs that, are, uh, that serve their address. Um, one of the things that's been the most difficult, however, and this also relates to my initial comment, is that um, we uh, are, are only able to provide up to six months of, of um, subsidy for them. So we just rolled off 485 people, um, which largely those were the folks, um, again, as I mentioned, we work with school districts and um, those, uh, those families who were approved through the, through the school district um, they had exhausted their, their funding. So at this point, we are referring them to the EBB. Um, I have a, a very part-time person who helps me. People might be surprised to learn I'm part-time. Um, and so uh, I think that's, that's going to change as a result of a grant that we just received. But... Um, <coughs> You know that there has to be some funding for for outreach, not just for us. This isn't just about Casey Digital Drive. This is about ensuring that the library has funding, that Goodwill has funding, that PCs for People has funding for this outreach, because they each organization has its own network of clients that they serve. And they are the trusted organization for that group of people. And so, you know, there are all kinds of people who, who, who will go into the library to get help with something that's, that's potentially very confidential, but they trust that, that they can go there and, and, and be served uh, without judgment, without, um, you know, without worry that, um, you know, they're, their business is going to be spread out all over. And so, um, again, with that emergency broadband benefit program, um, you know, it's great to say, oh, we've got $3.2 billion, with a B, dollars to work with, and that's across the country, however, and that means also that organizations have to 
um, you know, add that to their plate. Um, I went to um, uh, JFS, Jewish Family Services, had um, a food um, giveaway. And as part of that, um, a few of us volunteered. It, there were um, two women who we helped sign up for the EBB. One woman it took about 35 minutes, and the other woman it took about 20 minutes. Now, ironically, the one that took longer, um, she already was signed up with Lifeline, so it should have been a much quicker process, but she um, could remember her uh, login and password. And then it just took, I can't even tell you how much time to recover that, and, and that was with the help of a volunteer. And so, um, you know, there's a ton of one-on-one, -on -one really intensive work that needs to happen. Um, I would be remiss if, as a former Digital Inclusion Fellow, I did not um, congratulate um, my colleague there at Goodwill for her recent um, fellowship appointment. So congratulations on that. And, you know, I would just say, you know, thinking about how we can come up with um, with something that, um, you know, Tony and I have been talking about um, trying to deploy students, you know, to think about these, what we might call use cases. So, you know, what in the adoption space could open the door for someone? Like, what is the thing that would get them over the hump to actually start using a computer and, and get online? Is it, I no longer have to take three buses to go to the food stamp office and reapply? Is it, um, you know, I am and about ready to run out of my TANF and, and I, I need to, um, you know, get a job. And so how do I look for a job um, so that I can, you know, continue to, to keep a roof over my head? You know, what is the, the last thing that will, um, will really get people over that hump? And then back to the trusted organizations, um, Colin Reinsmith did just an amazing, amazing study on, on this, um, this sense of comfort and, and trust as it relates to digital literacy. And so, you know, how, how can we deploy these students into these organizations as an additional resource and get them experience, hopefully get them a little money and, and train them in these specific use cases, this is how you use Indeed or ZipRecruiter or you know, just apply for, uh, there was a, a study that, that just, a report that just came out about how difficult these um, online applications, even for um, these lower skilled um, jobs, you know? So it's not easy to apply online. It's, um, and kind of back to my fellowship, it was at the uh, Full Employment Council, so I'm also very interested in, in workforce development and will never forget, uh, we have a, uh, there was a bank of computers there and people would come in to look for jobs and there was a woman who, when I passed by, was just in a panic and she had um, gotten a ride to the Full Employment Council. Um, it was hotter and blazes outside that day and um, she was just frantically trying to apply to be a maid at a hotel, and she had accidentally pushed the button to send the job to someone instead of applying. And she was freaking out because her ride was gonna leave, and she just really needed this job. And, you know, this is just, it's, it's real for so many people, and if she had a computer and internet at home, she wouldn't have had to worry about that at all. And she could have been there in the comfort of her own home and she could have been applying for that job and she wouldn't have been freaking out and she would have had the, the time and, the, and the, the space in her mind to be able to navigate that process uh, more effectively. And so I, I guess I, I would just say that um, you know, I know Representative Reagan, you mentioned in our, our meeting earlier, I'm kind of blending them together in my mind, but everybody talks about money, but money, you know, equals resources, and that's really what we're talking about here. 
and and the time it takes um, to work with with people who are starting at at zero, um, you know, it it just is a a, a very um, labor intensive, time intensive process, and um, you know, in in the middle of all that, oftentimes. Um, people are, who are in crisis um, will will just see you almost as as, as part of their um, um, their resource to deal with those crises, and you end up in a <laughs> ended up in conversations with with some of our clients for an hour because they are going through things. It's 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 a hard time to be uh, for any time. And there are a lot of people dealing with it for the first time. And it's even harder for them because they have no context, background, uh, referrals, because this is the first time they've ever had to deal with it. So um, I'm just wrap up with, with saying that, um, you know, there's a lot of organizations doing great work, but um, so oftentimes we just have to take a shortcut because um, there's just so many people to serve. And um, so thinking about the fact that, uh, again, there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one that has to happen to, to really um, get people even started because they've been so out of the loop um, that they just feel like they, they can't even catch up. So I think in that, um, that vein, it's, it's much like uh, what Mary Kay deals with, um, you know, with people who are, are in the low literacy spectrum. Um, you know, again, um, I think someone mentioned getting handed a flyer and, and somebody nodding, you know, as if, you know, they could read it and understand the information and maybe they can. And so I think you get so far behind sometimes that you just feel like there's no catching up. Um, and that's where those one-on-one -on -one conversations and the persistence and the patience and the uh, empathy come in. And that's what the digital navigators are all about. Well, thank you. I'm gonna put on my um, community foundation, the Quincy area grant committee hat. So and somebody, if you can walk me through this, what we've described here is a process basically with digital navigators who can help with aging in place, mental health resources, depression, seniors, public libraries, stakeholders like Goodwill, workforce development, wraparound services for Medicaid, better health outcomes, digital literacy, I missed something, I'm not sure what. Is this the type of thing, and the question is in two parts, are any community foundations out there now who are funding something like that as a sort of a regional program? Second question is, if we were able to do this as a state to say we're gonna take some of these federal dollars, assuming, I'm looking at Jeremy, that the feds would allow us to either do it or apply for a waiver to do something, we could have a managed fund, we could keep the ball rolling, quote unquote. We, we're talking about a one shot. How do you take a one shot and convert it into something else? You basically invest it. So first question, community foundation, macro level, is anybody doing that in this area? Second is- I'm not gonna let my answer, but the Kansas Health Foundation that's on the other side of State Line Road? It is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you said you're not gonna like my answer. Well, it's but okay. The Health Foundation just recently ordered Casey Digital Drive and a few other um, folks uh, something. We're gonna work on a more of a ecosystem building process <laughs> on the Kansas side. Um, but, but we are looking for funding to do the same on the Missouri side. So. Um, Missouri Foundation so, for Health isn't, I mean, Northwest Corners where they're not. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, the Health Forward Foundation here in Kansas City has uh, uh, provided some support to Casey Digital Drive and the university is working with them for digital training for community health workers in our region. So that's an example. It's a narrow topic. Okay. Is that something you could write that up and, and basically give us? And, and I'm looking for the template that's already been struck rather than having to reinvent the wheel. Yes. Yeah. So if that's something so we can, can basically, basically take check. that, put it in the report, so tell other folks, hey, here's here's a model. It works. Yes. And basically convert that one-time money into something that's sustainable. And Representative yes. Riggs, I, I don't know if it passed or not, but but the state of Washington was looking at putting six million dollars into a digital navigator program. I was I was looking right before this, and I wasn't able to tell if that passed or not. But um, this is something that that states were looking at. I also can't weigh in on federal legislation because, especially since I have no say in in what happens there. But um, part of the infrastructure bill um, that's that's currently being discussed includes funding for the Digital Equity Act, which in, would include funding for things like this. Thank you. That's why that's why I asked you. You would know. <laughs> Good. So we have about five minutes left, and I want to make sure everybody that uh, came has a chance to say something they want to say. So uh, like I said, and like Representative Briggs mentioned, this will all end up in, in a report making recommendations going into next session. So uh, I just want to make sure if there's somebody here that's got something to say and they haven't had a chance to do so yet, uh, this is your time to speak up. Can you hear me? Oh, hey. Wow, that's why I sound like. <clears throat> um, my name is Aaron Wendell I'm with Kansas City Fiber. Um, we operate the fiber network in North Kansas City as a public private partnership between the city of North Kansas City and KC Fiber. Um, we've done so for the last six years and we provide free uh, broadband, gigabit broadband via fiber to every residence in North Kansas City. Uh, and of course, the economist is looking at me going, how, the, how do you do that? But uh, uh, we do it and have. And so we've gone through a lot of these uh, a lot of these things that that you uh, or a lot of these questions that you guys have had these challenges um, over the last five years. But the, the, the couple things I want to say, I want to reiterate the uh, the point about outreach. And that is, even though if you are in a house or an apartment or a mobile home, or whatever in North Kansas City, you can get gigabit fiber to your house free of charge. And we have an 80 percent uptick in the city. So there are 20 percent of the people who aren't taking advantage of, of that program. Uh, when we ask people why the the response is, well, I, I don't I don't think I need it. So there's there's the why do you need it, and then followed up with that there's the how do you use it. So both of those uh, topics need to be covered uh, in an outreach program. The other thing I, I'd like to mention to the committee is that the uh, Rural Broadband Initiative years ago put fiber all over the state of Missouri. There I, I can't think of a town in Missouri that does not have fiber running into it. The issue that uh, that came about is the the companies that took that money and ran that fiber then closed off their networks, and so they've been unable to make business cases to serve uh, cities like uh, a Gallatin or Napoleon or these little cities that have maybe uh, 2,000 users. There's just no business case then to expand the network in those towns. Uh, they have closed off the networks and won't allow other providers who can make a business case to do that. To go into those rural areas, and so when you look at the, uh, uh, the the barriers to entry going into small rural communities like that, the build out is of course the the biggest one. Uh, and so, as I said, the fiber already exists; it's already in the ground; it's mostly unused. Uh, federal dollars were used to put it in the ground, <clears throat> and it's just nobody can get access to it. And that's it. Thank you. I, I do want to say one last thing, and that's that I want to thank Representative Briggs for coming to Kansas City for a town hall. And, you know, this is my third year in the legislature, and I can tell you 
when Representative Riggs decides to do something, he does it really well. So uh, we're lucky that he's taking this on for our state. We're lucky he's taking this on for our region. And if you think of something later that you'd like to say, get a whole, get with me or get with Representative Riggs, and and it'll you know it'll be included in part of the process. But I, I would just like to give a round of applause to Representative Riggs for doing everything that he does. Thank you. I paid him to say that. <laughs> and I just want to say we have a great team. We, we put together an effort in the House. It's something that is a, a speaker priority. Um, I was basically asked, can, can we do interim committee? And uh, he said, pick one. Well, that was a no brainer for me. It's this. Uh, but this is something we're trying to hear from as many people as we possibly humanly can. That's why we're recording this. We'll make this thing available. Any information that you have, I don't care if it's a one pager, or whatever it is, please send it. I've got my cards out here. Uh, we collate that. We'll do it at the committee level. We'll write the report. But the recommendations we make are only as good as what we hear from, from you folks. I learned this a long time ago, 23 years old, working for Congressman Harold Volkner back in the day. Every county creates its own weather. And it's true. Every region of the state has its own particular problems. It's true. What we're trying to do at the macro level is reconcile what's going on everywhere so we can, we can do a solution that respects everybody's needs, meets them at the level of their need, and we do it in real time, i.e. before we're all termed out. And one of us is a lot closer to that than the others. And I know there's a sense of urgency on his part. We've had that talk. We've got to do something now. So we're, we're not in this to study it to death. We, we don't suffer from analysis paralysis. We want this thing to move, and we want it to move immediately. So thank you for coming out here. Thank you, Mayor, for making this available. Um, thank you for our uh, for folks at MARC, our regional planning commission, to refer to them as University Extension with money. Uh, they're great. They're in every county. They're a resource. Uh, they stepped up and said, if you need space, please ask. I asked. They said yes. Uh, so this is a great group effort. Uh, we'll have our next hearing in Jefferson City August 16th. We'll have another hearing in September. Uh, we'll, we'll hear more from providers in August. We'll hear from other stakeholders in September. I'm using October sort of as a fallback circle back around um, November meeting. I anticipate at this point we'll sit down, basically collate what we've got, start working on the recommendations, have the report shell basically filled out and able to talk about what we need to do to move this thing forward as a state. So again, thank you so much for coming out, contributing and just keep it coming. We'll, we'll do this till we've got this report put to bed. So thank you again.